Hello, young geographers. This is Ms. Wildy. This is our um, Chapter 4 video lecture, Preparing for the Test. Um, I would recommend either getting your study guide out to refer to or taking notes on a piece of paper, um, perhaps jotting down some questions you want to ask for further clarification in class. Um, just something to kind of keep, your, keep you going while you're um, listening to it. The first thing um, that the, the chapter really discusses is, is local versus folk culture, and I really want to reiterate that those terms should be used interchangeably. Um, for the purpose of this PowerPoint, we're going to use local culture from now on, um, but oftentimes you may see this on the, on the exam as being folk. And this is going to be a group of people that um, live very much within their own community. They um, are trying to promote that community or promote that culture. They are very much about um, staying the same, so very little change um, over time. And they would be considered homogenous, meaning they're going to be very, look very similar um, in terms of the clothes they wear, their, um, um, their customs, those kind of things are going to, going to be very, very much the same within that local culture. Um, and the Hutterites are discussed um, uh, quite a bit um, in this chapter, and we did a, um, a, a uh, discussion about them as well. Um, the uh, Hutterites are an example of local culture. They live remotely. They live separately. The men tend to look very similar. The women tend to look very similar. Um, they wear more traditional dress. They try and keep pop culture out. Um, and they've remained this way for a while. So again, there's not, not very many change over time. Um, and the, the chapter discusses where they live. Um, they're located in, um, in these states, um, in the northern United States and southern Canada. And remember that these are um, states that have lower populations in general, more rural in nature, especially in, in North and South Dakota, Montana, but even Saskatchewan, Manitoba, these are not highly populated provinces of Canada as well. So it's easy for them to find locations or colonies to, to, um, to, to be located, and they're not going to be um, heavily populated. They're not going to have to come in contact with pop culture very often, and that's why they locate where they do. Um, Pop culture, um, alternately, is a very heterogeneous group of people, very different looking. Lots of ethnicities or races, lots of um, differences in terms of the clothing that's worn, the language that are spoken, um, and they are going to be much more wide ranging, meaning they're going to be found all over the world, um, and they change frequently. Again, pop culture is all about change. Um, finding what the next best thing is going to be, and that's going to that's going to change on a weekly, monthly, even yearly basis. Um, and so that's very different from any folk culture that you're going to come in contact with. So um, one of the questions that the chapter discusses is how do culture traits from local cultures become part of whole pop culture? And so so the um, example in the book they give is the um, uh, Kabbalah bracelet, which is Kabbalah is a is sort of a sect of of Judaism, and Madonna wore it. Um, during a performance or during an, a, an interview, and it was seen by pop culture, and then it became began to take off. And it kind of lost its meaning, but it still was a part of a local culture that got put into pop culture. So celebrities can do this, or iconic image, um, uh, iconic figures can do this. Um, multinational corporations can do this. Um, even just, you know, communication between groups, like during a during an occupation or possibly even a war, information from one local culture can get spread to pop culture. Um, and again, these are some terms we've actually, or there's some images we've actually seen in the past with, with how culture traits diffuse. The hearth is a really important term to know. It's a, the origin, the point of origin, the place of origin for a culture trait. And then culture traits can, tra can, can basically spread contagiously or hierarchically in most cases. Contagiously means it's going to be done um, in all directions to as many people as possible. Everyone is, 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 is a possible connection for that trait. Hierarchical kinds of picks and chooses. It leapfrogs other, over other places and goes to kind of target certain groups or certain areas first. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in, a, in another, with another concept. So how are local cultures sustained? 
um, mostly by maintaining their customs. And a custom is just a practice or a ritual that is done by a group of people. And the um, example in the book with relating to this is the Macaw American Indians. And um, they wanted to, um, again, neolocalism, we'll get to that term, but they are trying to keep their culture alive. And so they wanted to reinstate the, the traditional whale hunt, where they use a harpoon um, for hunting. And unfortunately, they came up against pop culture um, and environmentalists because, again, it's it's not exactly um, kind to the to whales. Um, and whaling is is illegal um, in the in the country. So they had to go to court and they had to say that this was a part of of keeping their culture alive and that denying them that that right would be um, showing ethnocentrism or or um, um, superiority against them. So they did win. They had to use a different weapon, but they got to be able to do their whale hunt, which is which is trying to, to you know keep that custom alive so that they don't lose that culture trait. Two terms with any culture, whether it be um, local or popular, um, are going to be material versus non-material. And material culture are going to be things that you can actually touch, see, the art, the houses, the clothing, um, what foods they eat, what songs they sing, or the dances that they perform, things you would literally see if you went there, or hear, or, or taste, or, or, um, or even touch. Non-material are less obvious to the outsider. They're the beliefs, the practices, the values of the people. And we talked about this a bit with, um, um, with our Applying the Concepts activity, where you have the belief um, that Americans have the right to practice their own religion. That's a non-material culture. Um, the, the material culture of, of, of listening to the songs that are sung by the Amish, that's material culture. Yet, understanding that the importance of religion or importance of going to church and gathering together, of eating together in the community, that's going to be a non-material. It's a belief. It's a value. Um, so understanding those differences and being able to pinpoint those are going to be a key for this test. Um, this is another, uh, this is in reference to Little Sweden, which is another example of neo-localism. And this is using sort of that idea of material versus non-material. Is the Swedish Dala horse part of material or non-material culture? And so if you're seeing it, it's going to be material culture. Now understanding the importance of it is not going to be able to be seen just by looking at it. Um, if you understand the value of it or what it means for the community, then that's non-material. But the actual horse itself is material. And so in this age of globalization, local, popul local cultures are coming up against um, the diffusion of pop culture traits. And so they're having even more difficulty maintaining their customs. So oftentimes what they want to do is, is keep the, the pop culture out. They want to create a boundary around them. They want to locate in more rural areas. Um, staying away from pop culture as possible, as much as possible. And then secondly, to really push those customs that happen in their culture even more. So avoiding the cultural appropriation, which if you remember, we discussed as being where you adopt certain traits from other from other, other culture. Um, you're not losing your um, original, but you're you're using another one. They want to try to avoid that because usually what happens when you do that is over time you may assimilate, and that means that you lose your original uh, culture trait completely. Um, so again, cultural appropriation, you take on a new culture trait. If you completely lose your old culture trait and you only use the new culture trait, that's assimilation. So, so local cultures are going to try and avoid doing both of those. Because if you don't let in cultural appropriation, you don't come up against assimilation. So keep your culture trait in. Um, assimilation policies by the U.S., we discussed this, um, for the Native Americans. They forced the Native Americans to settle in one place. They forced them to farm instead of to be the hunters and gatherers that they had been. Um, they punished tribal members for speaking native language rather than English. They rewarded American Indians with citizenship and paid jobs. And they sent East Coast women to teach Native American women how to be good housewives. Um, and the idea was that if all of the Native Americans look and act and seem 
American, quote unquote, then there won't be that um, hatred or that tension between the two groups. Um, unfortunately, you know, of course, it, it's appeared and, and was a, a ethnocentric assimilation policy, very um, selfish in saying that our, our ways of doing things, our language is better than yours. Um, and so, and, it, and of course, some Native Americans resisted it as well because they didn't want to lose their own culture traits. Um, place. Um, oftentimes, the place or the space um, represents the culture. And we're going to talk about the cultural landscape in a little bit. But again, you have a strong emphasis on what the place or the space means for a culture. And they oftentimes leave their mark within that area um, in order to continue those customs and those beliefs of the local culture. Um, oftentimes, local cultures locate in rural areas. They, um, um, there's migration is less within rural areas. We remember that from chapter three. They can better separate from others and from pop culture. They can define their own space. There's more room for them. Um, and you can, you can much more live in a, in a separate community where you're doing things for your community only. You don't have to be, you don't have to share your economic activities with others. You can pretty much be self-sufficient. That's why many local cultures locate in rural areas. So Lindsberg, Kansas became known as Little Sweden. This was um, um, a group of Swedish immigrants that wanted to make sure their Swedish heritage and their Swedish culture was not lost. And so they redefined their space their place of Lindsberg, Kansas as Little Sweden so that they could try and keep it alive. And this again is an example of neolocalism where you are reinvigorating a culture, keep trying to keep it alive um, so that you don't lose it in the, in the modern world. There are some local cultures that locate in urban areas. Um, certainly these are going to be ethnic neighborhoods. They are going to locate near each other so that they can have each other together. But um, um, it creates a better place to practice those customs. Um, and you may in, use the urban environment in terms of the businesses or the houses of worship or schools in order to support your local culture. So. Um, um, the example that they give in the book is the um, Hasidic Jewish neighborhood of New York in Williamsburg, which is in Brooklyn. Um, and again, you will see um, lots of the different characteristics and customs of the Hasidic Jews within this neighborhood. Um, and they have been able to maintain this while also living in the urban environment. It's harder to do. It's much harder to do. But it is possible to do it. Another important term for this chapter is commodification. And this is where you have a, um, an item or um, a, a product, something that was not traditionally bought and sold and is now being bought and sold. It can be material. It can be non-material. It can even be a place itself. But you are buying and selling it. You are creating a profit related to it that wasn't there before. One of the important things to remember with commodification is Anyone can can take an item and make it um, a product or make it bought and sold. It can be the local culture themselves. It can be pop culture outside or an international corporation. Um, it does not have to be just the local culture. It can be anyone. However, oftentimes what comes into play with, with commodification is the, an idea of authenticity and whether or not something is an actual authentic experience, authentic product, or whether it's just made to look that way. So the Irish pub companies, um, where they're building these, you know, quote unquote, authentic Irish pubs around the world, um, is it really authentic? Because there are some in Ireland, certainly, and some of them are even pretty old, which are probably more authentic than one that may be built in Las Vegas, for example, which is still an Irish brew pub owned by an Irish company, um, but it's not truly quote unquote authentic because it, it was made to give you an experience, but it's changed sort of the, the, the dynamics of what a truly authentic experience would be. Um, 
So this is, um, and the other thing that comes into play is this is a pub, the Little Bridge Pub in Ing Ireland. It is an Irish cup pub, but it is not owned by the Guinness Brew Pub Company. So is it really authentic or not? And that's sort of what comes into play when you have this commodification. All right, so how is popular culture diffused? Um, typically, most culture traits spread contagiously from the hearth. Um, it can differ, but for the most part, they're going to spread by migrants, through war, um, through colonization or occupation, through transnational companies. Again, we, we remember our um, Merchants of Cool video. Um, or it can be actual individuals, either celebrities or, or um, iconic figures, um, like, for example, Tony Hawk with the um, um, extreme sports. Um, but these are typically how popular, popular, popular culture traits are going to be spread. Um, one of the examples they talk about is music. And we mentioned this quite a bit within our, cha our chapter examples, too. And what, one of the bands that they talk about in the book is Fish. Um, and Fish began as a college band, and it spread from college town to college town. That's hierarchically. Um, REM is another college town band from Athens, Georgia, and they spread from Athens to other college towns within the southeast, and later the country, and then later the world. Um, that's hierarchical diffusion. Um, there are some bands that later on diffuse by relocational diffusion. And Fish is one of those. Another one is um, Grateful Dead. And they spread because the fans actually re relocate themselves to different places where the band will, will, um, will perform, and they spread the music first. So um, music can spread hierarchically, most likely, but later it can also be relocational by fans following the concert routes. And so that's when Fish comes into play, and Grateful Dead is another one that, um, that was relocational diffusion. Um, and we talk about the idea of distance decay. We've talked about it in, in several chapters. So it's no different with this one. When we talk about a diffusion of a trait, um, the longer the distance, the harder it is for that trait to be diffused. However, in modern times, you have something called time-space compression. And that's where... Um, technology, communication, transportation, those kind of things have made it where distance doesn't matter as much. And so it compresses the, 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 um, the distance um, where it doesn't feel as much, where it feel, feel as far, excuse me, and then, and then the culture trait can diffuse very rapidly. So if you have areas that have lots of technology, lots of communication networks, then, then a trait can spread very quickly, um, even though the distance may be very far. Um, and again, pop culture is going to spread a lot faster with time-space compression. Um, and, and fashion is another um, area that spreads hierarchically. And again, if you have those, those um, connections, both with transportation, communication, media, um, you know, iconic figures, again, are going to spread that, that popular culture trait like fashion or music um, very quickly. And, and distance matters no, not, again, not anymore. And again, if you have people traveling, then you will also have something called re-territorialization that will happen. And this is when people within an, a place start to produce, um, they take an, an aspect of culture from somewhere else and they put it in a new location, a new territory, and they make it of, um, applicable to them, taking it in the context of their own place. And we talked about this quite a bit um, in terms of music. Remember, the immigrants um, brought rap that was a, you know, rap was a um, something that started in the inner city neighborhoods of Atlanta, New York, Detroit, LA. And then it was brought to other inner cities of the United States. And later, immigrants actually brought it to Germany. And instead of um, just keeping it the same, they had to adapt it and make it worthwhile for their local culture or for Germany. So they made it in German, and they made it about the problems associated with German inner cities. 
So that's a that's re-territorialization. We also looked at the Irish Gaelic version of Cups, which it's the same, it's the same song, it's all, it's even the same um, application with using the cups, but they made it uh, available and much more personal for them by putting it in the Irish Gaelic language. Um, <clears throat> and we also did an exercise where we looked at fashion, food sports and television and these are also areas where re-territorialization happens quite a bit so remember to think about those examples um, sometimes you have um, a new hearth come about usually what has to happen is that something is taken to a new place and re-territorialized but then something might actually create it create something new off of it and then we have a new hearth so um, sports, for example, like baseball, football, basketball, um, these all started in the United States and they were changed and they were, they were standardized with um, transportation routes, with electricity, with communication networks like television, telegraph, you know, radio, internet. And we also have institutions like leagues that set up these rules. And that helps sort of um, solidify the, the, the sport but then when it's taken somewhere else it may be changed into a new sport and extreme sports can come about and that will then create a new hearth for that sport so that can happen as well um, how can local and pop cultures be seen on the cultural landscape this is that last section of the chapter and so the cultural landscape is again the visual human imprint that people make on their place um, and it's the buildings that they build and the art that they make and the stores and restaurants and um, uh, schools and all of the things that humans leave. But that tells a whole lot about culture. Um, and pop culture certainly has left its mark on the world, um, specifically with the, the three regions that have the most influence. North America for food, music, and sports. Um, has more influence on Western Europe and Japan. Western Europe has more influence on North America and Japan um, based on fashion, art, and philosophy. And Japan has lots of influence on North America and Western Europe in terms of electronics and technology. Um, and, and you would see those imprints not just within those three areas, but all over the world. In response to this, France, for example, has started to... Um, do things to try and keep the French language intact, away from the global influence of Japan or Northern North America. And so the French government subsidizes its domestic film industry, meaning they give money to the film industry. In response, um, the film industry is supposed to make films that are in French, using French actors, French producers, those kind of things. And French TV and radio must have 40% of on-air time in French. They also have to feature new artists about half of that time. And the idea is that what happens then is that new artists want to perform their music in French so that they will have more on-air time. Um, and that solidifies that idea that France um, really is proud of its language and wants to keep it intact in, in, in this global world where English is the global language or um, you know, other countries are, are having an influence on them. They're trying to respond to it. <clears throat> Another concept that's related to the cultural landscape is placelessness, and this is where you have sort of a, a loss of uniqueness. And when you look at the cultural landscape, it's going to look like you you um, somewhere else you've been. Everything kind of looks the same. Um, there are three main sort of dimensions or, or reasons that they say this happens. One of them is the diffusion of architectural forms and planning ideas. So the skyscraper. Fundamentally, the skyscraper is one of those iconic architectural forms, and now it's no longer just in the United States. You can find it all over the world. And, and these new, you know, booming cities, these urban, urbanized areas are building their own tallest buildings, these skyscrapers. But what happens is that when you see the, the landscape or the cityscape, um, you're going to notice these big tall buildings and you're not going to be able to really differentiate this city from this city. They look the same. Another reason for the for the placelessness is the businesses and products that you see. So, um, of course, McDonald's, of course, Coca-Cola, Hard Rock Cafe as well. Um, these iconic logos, 
companies are now found in every city. So you walk down the street in Rome or Paris or Tokyo um, or even like Jakarta in Indonesia and you're going to see the same businesses, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Hard Rock, all of those kind of things are going to be seen in all of these cities and they're going to look very similar as a result. And the last reason that we have sort of placelessness around the world is the borrowing of of images and that and that can be the way that the buildings are laid out or areas of the city are laid out um, but there's not going to be any sort of distinct unique characteristics of the city anymore they're going to look very much like other cities that you've visited and because of that you you're not a, quite sure you've gotten off the plane from where you where you took off because things are looking the same um, the other issue we have with this global world and, and the um, connections that we have around the world is something called the global local continuum. And, and simply it means that when you have something happening on either a local scale, it's going to affect the global, or if you have the global, something that happens on the global scale, it's going to affect the local. And that that's not going to um, be easy to stop um, because of the connections that we have in the world, because of our growing businesses that are all over the world and the architectural forms and all of these reasons, things then that happen at one scale are going to affect the other. And so the process by which these things alter the other scale, that's called localization. Um, so without, with, with the process of localization, you have the continuum apply. Um, and again, we've talked about this several times. When you have, um, um, it can be as simple as a disease on a local scale that can easily, because of communication and, and transportation networks, it can spread around the world very rapidly. That's a local to global. But you could also have um, examples like, um, the um, if something you know, happens on a global scale, like a war, you will feel that at a local scale, and people, people, local businesses will be affected by something that's happening on the global scale. That's the global local continuum. The last part of the chapter deals with house types. Again, housing is a major part of um, the way that we leave an imprint on our landscape. Um, and Niffin had three American house styles that he talks about specifically or that he really des described. Um, these three, New England, Mid-Atlantic, and Southern Tidewater, began on the East Coast and spread in a Western fashion. Again, that's where the colony started. The one exception to this is the ranch style house, which began in California, so it was a West to East approach. And that didn't happen until the 1920s, whereas New England, Mid-Atlantic, Southern Tidewater were much more related to the the early colonies and you know 1800s um, type of architecture types for house types and this is a map that shows you um, where you know new england the hearth of it the hearth of mid-atlantic the hearth of southern tidewater and how it diffused into the rest of the united states all in a western direction but just whether it be in the northern northern part the central part or the southern part um, and today we, of course, have these house types all over. Um, and that's another, another example of this, this rapid diffusion of culture traits from one place to another. Historically, it used to be that materials for making houses were what were native to the area and what made sense for the environment. But nowadays, we have materials that um, can be shipped in from anywhere, and we go more for efficiency and technology and less about style or aesthetics. And that's the, the end of the show. So um, any questions you have, bring with you for the test. And um, hopefully this will help quite a bit. Thanks.